All right, uh, during Monday's solar eclipse, it wasn't just people on Earth that could view the spectacle from the terrestrial planet. Views of the eclipse also came from outer space. Starlink, an internet company from Elon Musk, posted a video of a view of the eclipse from one of its uh, satellites. And that satellite, of course, rounding the Earth, you can see the black spot. There it is. That black spot is, of course, uh, where the eclipse was taking place. You could see that uh, from Texas uh, in the United States. Now, satellites are part of an outer space economy valued at a whopping 1.8 trillion by the year 2030. This according to a new report from the World Economic Forum uh, in knowledge partnership with McKinsey and company titled Space, the 1.8 trillion opportunity for global economic growth. Now we are happy to discuss this with Nikolai Kristoff. Uh, he is the lead space technology at the World Economic Forum. He joins us from Colorado Springs, Colorado. Good morning to you. Uh, thank you so much, Nikolai, uh, for joining us. Um, so beginning with the report, it says that uh, the economy, the space economy could go from $630 billion in 2023 to $1.8 trillion by 2035. What are the triggers uh, for this growth? Thanks so much, Rodos, and great to be uh, here with you to talk about this a little bit more. So there are several key uh, triggers for this. Uh, one of them, of course, is the changing cost for launch. Uh, it has fallen significantly over the last couple of decades, uh, even more so over the last 10 years. And we foresee that this cost will continue to fall. Uh, now, of course, uh, uh, SpaceX plays uh, an important role here. Uh, and it will be interesting to see what happens with, 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 with Starship flights in the coming months. Uh, connectivity is another big, uh, important cost factor here. Uh, and we foresee that to further fall uh, by another 10% uh, in the coming years, perhaps uh, uh, arguably not as significant as the launch in, uh, is the cost in launch. Uh, the other element is, of course, commercial innovation. Um, when you look at uh, what Earth observation satellites uh, can see, uh, and, um, uh, and this is an important component of the economy, um, you know, you can get down to almost 15 uh, centimeters in terms of resolution that can give you even more in terms of insights um, and help industry on Earth. Uh, diversification of investment. So where is the money coming from? This is another big uh, part of the story. Uh, it's not just uh, venture funds um, and, and, and early stage investment. Uh, you largely have more and more corporate investors coming in, um, as well as institutional investors, uh, as well as national uh, players coming in and uh, more interest in space from different geographies uh, at the national agency level. So, uh, and, and finally, the other uh, important element I think uh, that's, that's, uh, that's, uh, that's playing here is cultural awareness. So public's image uh, and perception of space activities. Um, as you've seen uh, just now with, with the uh, great photo footage uh, of the eclipse, um, you know, or science missions and, and things like James Webb, uh, the public is really following uh, space activities closely. There are, you know, missions uh, to the moon uh, almost monthly these days. Um, and so there's a lot of excitement um, and that's helping generate and stimulate further, further activity and, and growth. Thank you so much for the breakdown. You have to forgive me for going to pop culture. Now, I wanna, I've got to remind our viewers about this, uh, about a, a very famous animated film. I think it's one of the most, uh, one of the most, one of the most successful animated films in, in history. Uh, but it's, it's prompted, it was prompted by a quote from the report. Um, in the report, it says, essentially, that the opportunities uh, in space actually go beyond, right? Space impact will increasingly go beyond space itself. Yeah, that's the quote. So space impact will increasingly go beyond uh, space itself. It reminded me, and I'm going to have to get our viewers to rem remind themselves of uh, Toy Story and the character Buzz Lightyear, where he says to infinity and beyond. Let's take a quick look. To infinity and beyond! <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do it. I'm sorry. But there's the thing. Your quote is not referring to beyond space. It's actually talking about planet Earth. Essentially, that supply chains, I think we have the list, food and beverage, state-sponsored defense, and digital communications. That's the beyond that you were referring to. Can you talk us through how those entities can benefit from this uh, space economy that you're discussing in the report? Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, and great clip there. Uh, indeed, we are talking about what space is doing for us here uh, on Earth. And it's happening every day today. 
Um, it's just that when we look at the next uh, 10 years, the next decade, um, these numbers will change significantly. And in many of these cases, in many of these examples, uh, the, the economic figures will double, triple, or even quadruple in some instances. Now, what is it based on? It's based on uh, satellite data and services. So we're talking about primarily about positioning, navigation, and timing. So this is a big one, actually, in, in, in these estimates when you look at uh, uh, 1.8 trillion. Um, what does it enable? Uh, well, it directly enables things like ride sharing, or, or food delivery um, across a couple of these sectors. Uh, without uh, global positioning satellites, these uh, business uh, businesses would just not exist um, in the way that they do today. And they are set to grow significantly over the coming decades. Of course, there are more industrial applications in supply chains. Um, the other one is connectivity. Um, we have increasing number of satellites providing connectivity from different companies um, on Earth. Uh, and this is gonna increase um, and provide even greater insights and be able to connect businesses uh, from all sorts of locations. Uh, it's not just about having uh, access to internet on a plane, it's uh, being able to put a, a, a connectivity station and a, a, and a receiver in a remote location where perhaps you're not able to connect um, with, with a landline or, or, or a cell tower. Um, and the other one is Earth observation. Um, and, and again, as I mentioned before, these satellites uh, are getting better at, at, at seeing more on the ground. And, and this can really enable uh, and provide services to a, a large number of industries um, uh, on, on the ground. So uh, those are, those are the, the, key, the key aspects that will drive uh, these numbers. It's not about uh, you know, satellites per se and rocket launches. Of course, those uh, uh, subsectors will increase, but it's really about what they do for different industries uh, on Earth and how they enable better uh, and, and greater economic growth. Great, great stuff. Uh, and I also want to get to, and I know you touched on this, the four main drivers of the prevalence of space in everyday life. You've mentioned the rocket launches, um, but particularly, I think number four on the list, um, Oh, well, number one, two, three. Yeah, number four, the cultural awareness and enthusiasm. It, the reactions to the eclipse the solar eclipse um is that an example because it was it was treated as a main event at least all media houses around the world we covered it as well here um is, is that also critical to this um space economy as far as cultural awareness and enthusiasm from everyday people is concerned look i i think you're absolutely right there are different facets of of, of space activities a lot of that of course is scientific um, and I think the solar uh, uh, the eclipse comes uh, into that, uh, but it is appreciation of what's happening um, uh, in space, you know, uh, how the sun works, uh, how the moon uh, rotates around the earth, of course. Um, so that's the scientific angle. I think that, that, that that's part of the big story, you know, when we look at what James Webb uh, has been able to achieve, the types of images uh, he's been able to provide. Um, you know, almost since since being launched uh, right away, almost right is is, is absolutely fascinating. Um, being able to see our Earth, our planet Earth from space, uh, is part of it. This is thanks to satellites orbiting Earth with different types of cameras, uh, different types of radars, uh, and we're able to see our planet and how fragile it is, of course, as well. Um, you know, rocket launchers make the news as well uh, uh, on a weekly, monthly basis. Landings on the Moon. Different countries um, uh, have had successful or, or semi-successful landings in the recent months. Um, so this all together plays, I think, in the, in the public psyche uh, and how people perceive uh, space activity. Now, speaking of space activity, on the matter of launches, I want to ask you about commercial space flights. You've got Blue Origin from Jeff Bezos, the billionaire owner of Amazon. You've got Virgin Galactic from billionaire uh, Richard Branson. Are these just thrill rides for wealthy people who have the money to go suborbital, or is there some utility here? That's a great question. Um, and I think this is the one that uh, the public also uh, tends to ask of it, uh, itself. Um, now, I think it's important to remember that this we're still talking about single digits in terms of uh, commercial tourists uh, are flying today. Of course, this makes the news, uh, you know, especially when you have famous people going up. They talk about it. They talk about the experience. Um, now, actually, in the report, we don't foresee uh, the space tourism industry to grow um, to grow into you know astronomical numbers uh, by thirty five. It will grow significantly, uh, but we're still talking about single digit billion. 
um, uh, market uh, versus the 1.8 trillion that we talk about as a whole space economy uh, over the coming 10 years. So it's still a small fraction. Uh, now, I think it's important in, 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 in helping promote activities and, and showcase what space is about. Uh, you know, there's this famous uh, overview effect that people talk about when they see Earth from space and they come back with a different uh, perception of, of, you know, you don't see borders, you see how fragile the atmosphere is, how thin it is. Um, so I think it's an interesting addition to, to the whole discussion of why space is important. Um, but again, it's important to, to note that it's still a very small part uh, of the entire space sector. All right, you have to forgive me this next question. I'm going back to pop culture and film again, and I might be taking you outside a bit here, but um, the Oscar-winning director, um, Christopher Nolan, uh, his 2014 movie, Interstellar, uh, there was a particular quote from the character Cooper, played by Matthew McConaughey, where he says, mankind was born on Earth, but wasn't meant to die here. I want us to take a look at that. Mankind was born on Earth. It was never meant to die here. Very, very quick quote. Elon Musk has talked about colonizing Mars. Um, is it logical that mankind gets so advanced with space travel that we eventually leave the planet and uh, settle elsewhere? Is that, I mean, if you look, you know, I guess as, as far as progression is concerned, what's, what's your take on that? Well, good question and a great quote uh, from a great movie. Um, look, we don't cover that far into the future. Uh, uh, in the report, of course, we, we, we stay um, a little bit more in, in, in the practical in the today. Um, uh, so this is probably a little bit beyond 35 and, and probably beyond my expertise. Uh, certainly no, I'm not a scientist. Um, but look, if you talk to, to, to actual scientists who, who, who study planets, who study our own planet, uh, most of them will agree that, you know, this is our planet is the best place for us um, that we know. And we have to protect it um, and, and do what we can to ensure it's, 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 you know, we can live safely on our planet. Now, it doesn't mean that we can't explore uh, beyond. And of course, you know, we've had an extremely successful uh, 50 plus 60 years in terms of exploring our solar system uh, with multiple robotic probes. Uh, going to different places, extreme environments. Um, of course, a number of successful missions from different countries to Mars itself. Uh, we're talking about going back to the moon. Um, uh, there, again, as I mentioned, there have been several landings on the moon. Um, but let's not forget, back to, 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 to dollar terms, uh, economic terms, uh, this is part of civil space, civil exploration missions uh, that we also foresee to grow. So we'll see, we will see more of these uh, kind of missions uh, a lot of them are going to be robotic. Um, again, some of these environments are extremely, extremely uh, uh, challenging for us to survive in. Uh, again, we have some experience, of course, um, and I think it will be interesting to see what would happen in the coming years with, uh, with the return to the moon. Um, but a Mars settlement is probably, uh, is, is, uh, uh, in most scientists' views, uh, is, is still uh, far away. And, you know, we have to think about our own planet first. Um, then, then think about moving to Mars. <laughs> Indeed, I'm, I'm with you there. Um, I want to get you know to internet connectivity. Um, there was an incident that happened about three weeks ago. Much of Western and Southern Africa suffered an internet outage um, when undersea cables uh, supplying connectivity were damaged. Uh, we were affected here, here um, in our in our studio. Now, is the future of internet connectivity going back to satellites? Um, is that where it is, or do you still see undersea cables still being here for a while, still being relevant as far as providing connectivity? Uh, conversation. Um, I'm not a, a telecom expert per se, so this report doesn't cover so much the, the interrelationships between space connectivity and terrestrial. Um, but space is going to complement, right? We're not talking about replacing all the infrastructure. Um, and, and thousands of kilometers of cables, of course, on Earth, which is uh, currently and probably for the foreseeable future, the, the best way to get data around our planet. Um, as, as, as you mentioned, uh, infrastructure on Earth is vulnerable to different types of events and activities. Um, and, uh, but, it, but it is there. It's, it's it, you know, the best way to get data to the vast majority of population on Earth. But look, it, it will fill a gap. 
it will support uh, terrestrial connectivity in places where you know there are no cables, there are no cell towers, and perhaps also in times of outage, um, as you just referred to. So uh, we will have more of it. It will be uh, it will be cheaper. Um, uh, perhaps we don't foresee it to be orders of magnitude cheaper. Um, but it will be interesting to see how this market evolves and will be an important component increasingly uh, to help plug these gaps um, and, and whether it's on a, a consumer side or on the business side, uh, provide that, that critical link to the internet. All right, uh, my final question, and, and Nikolai, you've already answered this technically with the, with the Mars uh, answer, but it's not every day you get a chance to speak to the lead uh, at technology at the World Economic Forum. So I just, yeah, forgive me, please. The, <laughs> the search for life on other planets, we've got a diagram of the habitable zone, right? And I know you're not a scientist, I know you are, I know you said this and you made this very clear already, but as far as the atmospheric composition of our planets, uh, where Earth's position is, the Goldilocks zone, uh, the habitable zone, okay, so there it is, not too far from this, not too close to the sun where Mercury is, or it's too high, not too cold and too far where Pluto uh, is, which is, I think Pluto is no longer a planet anymore, it's just a frozen rock. The search for habitable life on other planets, using telescopes, using uh, signs of water uh, elsewhere, does that get advanced with space travel? Great question, and I probably will need to change my title not, <laughs> not, not to get this challenging questions, uh, not, not being a scientist myself. No, look, uh, it's, it's obviously a question that, that, that we ponder as humanity. It's probably more philosophical to a certain extent, uh, so certainly out of the realms of, 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 of this report. But look, it comes back to the question of, of, of exploration and, and, and civil space. And uh, a lot of these instruments that we've uh, been investing and launching, uh, but also you know satellites that, and, and radars that we have um, uh, on the ground, right? Extremely powerful satellites, and there are new ones coming on board, extremely complex ones. We're able to see further and further into space, and, and that means, by definition, to the beginning of the universe as we know it and understand it better. Again, James Webb uh, telescope, extremely complex uh, machine, uh, expensive as well. Um, you know, is able to look, uh, you know, uh, as far back as, as we've ever been able to do. And it already started to produce uh, and uncover some insights in terms of early universe. Um, but it also, some of these telescopes uh, can see increasingly uh, uh, planets in these habitable zones. And this is, I think, what the scientists uh, that are looking for, for signs of life or signs of uh, potential habitable uh, environments are looking for. And so they can see um, uh, because of the light and how it passes through the atmosphere of these planets, what can be perhaps in, in those atmospheres. Um, and that's exciting. You know, there are uh, uh, thousands of planets uh, uh, that have been found. I don't think we have any proof yet of any signs of life uh, definitively. So uh, I think fascinating area. And again, but we wouldn't be able to know any of this um, unless we had space programs. Um, and these space programs uh, require some investments, but they produce tremendous benefits for us um, on Earth here in, in, in a myriad of ways. So, you know, we're excited uh, to have and to see these uh, continued programs uh, grow and, and we hope the public will continue uh, uh, watching for this space uh, in the years to come. Nikolai Kristov, it's, it's past 4 a.m. in Colorado Springs. You've been a great sport. Thank you so much. Lead uh, technology at the World Economic Forum. You've written a great report. I definitely enjoyed reading it and I hope everybody else enjoys getting into it as well. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it.